All right, so when Jesus is born in Matthew 2, you have this star. And the Magi know that this star is here somehow. And these Magi come from the east. Where are they coming from? I think they're coming from Babylon. Why are they coming from Babylon? I think it's because that's where Israel was in exile for 70 years. And many of them stayed after that. And this is where Daniel was brought when he was in exile. And Daniel knew the prophecies and he knew how to look at the signs. I mean, no culture in history had ever been as good at understanding the heavens as the Babylonians. Welcome back to Blurry Creatures, the podcast about creatures, and we talk about the historical context of creatures, whether it's Bigfoot, giants, or modern day sightings of weird things that don't fit the narrative or the paradigm. But today we're talking to author Doug Van Dorn. He wrote a book about the giants, and that's why we originally brought him on the show. But since we've become good friends, and Doug comes on the show quite a bit, and we talk about all kinds of things. But today we're talking about sort of the signs in the heavens, and this one's a uh, Kind of about blurry skies, things that the ancient knew, ancient people knew about the signs in the heavens and stars and such, and what does that mean, biblically speaking, and why we kind of just stay away from it because we're all afraid of the topic in general. But we're talking about that this week. Doug is a good guy and a good friend, and we're pumped to have him on the show this week. If you are just joining us, welcome to the Blurry Verse. We got Doug to do some funny uh, radio voices. <laughs> at the end of the episode and you'll hear those but if you are good with the 80s you understand that we're kind of an 80s show we have like an 80s theme that's how we use to market our show obviously we're not an 80s show but we need something to make it fun here on blurry creatures and this song waiting for a star to fall hopefully some of you guys out there know your your songs from the 80s but if you want to become a member of this podcast and support the show blurry creatures.com slash members can't say enough uh, thanks to all the people who support the show. That's how Luke and I do this. You get access to your own private RSS feed, which means you get the bonus episodes right to your phone, access to chat rooms where you get to hang out with other members, and you get to chat with us on Zoom calls once a month. And for the gold members, we do a little extra perks. You get your own channels, and you get access to our movie nights. We watch movies at least once a month, sometimes more. And we all hang out and chat and watch a movie together. So, blurrycreatures.com slash members. Doug Van Dorn is coming up next. And we're going to have him at BlurryCon. And sorry for anyone who didn't get tickets to that. We are working on details for people who purchase a live ticket. Sort of a digital access ticket to a live stream. So, stay tuned. Information is coming. If you're not on our email list, get on our email list. So, you know when that happens. But let's get Doug Van Dorn on the show. This is Doug Van Dorn, and you are now entering the blurry verse. The history of our Earth is so different from what we can imagine. The Smithsonian, that if they found out about a large skeleton somewhere, was to go get it. I'm going to assume at least one person is right, because if one person's right, it busts the paradigm. It all goes back to the fallen chair. And the problem with the modern day church, they have a very truncated view of the supernatural. This backdrop is just pregnant with all kinds of meaning associated with this Mount Hermon event. Whoa. And this guy defects from the kingdom. That's a big deal. Welcome back to the podcast, Doug Van Dorn, the legend. This is your sixth or seventh time on our show. We've talked about all kinds of things. We've done series with uh, demonology. We've talked about giants author, pastor, and you become a good friend of ours. Thank you for fielding text messages and phone calls. And that's what I really love about Blurry Creatures is that we've, we've created a community that feels real and 
The world's getting weirder by the day, blurrier by the hour, and sometimes you just got to text your friends, did you see this? Did you see that? This is getting weird. <laughs> it's, it's getting strange. So welcome back to Blurry Creatures, Doug. Always good to be here with you guys. Doug, got to ask you though. <laughs> yes. I know you've been thinking about Bigfoot because you're out there in Colorado. you have any updated thoughts on the, our blurry fella? Updated thoughts on Bigfoot. Well, I, I actually thought of a story. This is a true story from 2000 okay. around 2003 it it involves my my brother you've been holding on to this one yeah this i've been holding nugget. on to yeah. this one i've been holding on to this one so this involves my brother he 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 lived out in la for 25 years and he went on a uh, some sort of like a camping trip up in the woods up in northern california and you won't believe who he went with he went with uh, neil mcdonough ever heard of him captain america guy Minority yeah. reports. Huh. He was he was one of the guys that got that borged in first contact on on the, when they went oh. walking out on the ship. Let's go. And he was there with uh, Gary Marshall, the guy who was married to Penny and and started Laverne and Shirley, Mark and Mindy. Wow. And he was there with a guy named Jarrett Lamaster, who you you might you wouldn't know who he is, but you would see him if you watch the Babylon Bee because he's kind of become the. The main guy on their short videos. So what were they doing out there, Doug? They're making a movie? It sounds like you got like a cast. So dude, they were out there and they they were spending the night, several nights, and they saw Bigfoot several times. And you can see this in his movie called They Call Him Sasquatch. No. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, my brother made this Bigfoot movie 20 years so, ago. So of with course these people. Saw it's called They Call Him Sasquatch. <laughs> and he told me, he goes, he goes, if you tell them they need to watch it, then I'm going to kill you because it's. he doesn't like the movie. <laughs> yeah. Now everybody needs to go and watch that movie. <laughs> now we need to go, we go watch it. All exactly. of a sudden, the sales for this like B-movie Sasquatch are going to go out the, out the roof. There's actually a lot of movies about Bigfoot. There are. You, do, you wouldn't think it, but there's a lot. And then a lot of documentaries, a lot of poor ones. I hold fast to the Andre the Giant version of Bigfoot, if we're going to be honest. I think speaking of plugging stuff, Doug, Doug, you never plug any of your stuff. You really don't. I think I think we should do that for you here because <laughs> Doug, you've written a bunch of books, and we're we're not gonna today. We're not talking about any of those specifically, but you've written a book on giants called Giants, um, Sons of the Gods, Five Souls of Reformation, Covenant Theology, Waters of Creation, Conspiracy Theory. We should do an episode on that. Angel of the Lord, yep. you wrote from the shadows. What is it? There's one uh, one on Galatians. I'm just actually looking at your. I'm doing a poor job of reading the small print, the small print on your website. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but no, I want. Did we log? Dude, you're such a great friend yeah. to us and to the show that like, uh, listen, guys. Doug has spent all the hours, and one of the things we do on our show and we talk about a lot, Nate, is that you know we want to bring people on, people on that spent the ten thousand hours being experts. You know, because we're here to learn and we're here to talk about. You know, one of the things I like personally, selfishly about the show, Nate, is learning, and you know, people like Doug Van Dorn have been in there putting it, putting out the work and putting. Mm -hmm. You know, we're grateful for you when you spend an hour plus with us to talk about the things that you've researched and learned. But DouglasVanDorn.com. Doug's not going to plug it. We're going to plug it. Go check it out. Yeah. Get, get yourself yeah. a book direct from the source. My man, there's right. a lot of books behind you. <laughs> I do have I a know. few books behind me. Yep. No, I wanted to we, make sure we did that before we forgot mm -hmm. to do that because we get it. Well, that's awfully nice of you, Luke. No, we appreciate it. Yeah. I, so many people have been so kind and awesome to us and. I love it when people get on our Instagram or on our social channels and post pictures of buying the books. A lot of people buy the books and people come on the show. So thank you. People still buy books. They don't buy DVDs as we were talking about before the show, but, but they buy books and you gotta, you gotta work on some eighties spins, put, put some eighties. <laughs> Dude, some splatter paint maybe and some neon colors. Yeah. Compare some theology to eight to an eighties movie and it'll be a hit. <laughs> the, the theology of Teen Wolf. Yeah. I can't wait for it to come out. Yeah. Theology. It's going to happen. These corduroy OP shorts. Dude, oh man, bring those back. No, but we today, Doug, we were um we had been talking back and forth about wanting to to do an episode and you recently did some speaking and so we reached out about talking about the blurry skies and would love to jump into that. I know that one of the things you've been working on and researching is astral prophecy correct astral prophecy yeah yeah so this was a talk that i gave for skywatch and their defender conference anybody who's interested in what we'll talk about here tonight can go to defenderconference.com and they can sign up for the conference i think it's like november 4th or something like that and it'll be an online deal and they have, you have access to a whole bunch of different presenters i'll just be one of those and uh i gave two two talks 
I'll only give you kind of part of one of those tonight. Uh, one of them we already did actually it was on Serpent Mounds with Blurry Creatures. So, and Judd. So this one's going to be on uh, astral prophecy, and this is something that I have not formally written about. I, I have it in a bunch of sermons. So this is stuff I was coming across when I was preaching through Revelation about two years ago. And it just kept coming up over and over and over again in the book of Revelation. And so anybody who would be interested in more of a deep dive on that until we end up publishing the book on Revelation, which is a long way out if we ever do it, you can just go to our website, www.rbcnc.com, and all those PDFs are there available for free. And you can listen to the sermons too. They're all linked there. Hmm. Love that. I know. I know we I have some glory creatures folks that go to your church. So, yep. Yeah. yeah. So they got they got direct access. They want the hard copy. <laughs> like printing out map quests back in the day. Like, print it out for us, stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they'll be like, uh, we already heard this, but that's okay. Hear it again. We talk a lot about how the ancients knew, had this knowledge. A lot of people don't understand that, you know, you're trying to argue for the blurry things and give people give people some context of why you can trust that the ancients had more knowledge than we did. Not only to build things that we can't build, but also they had this alignment down. They understood the constellations, the stars, and and it, it comes up a lot on our show. And there's something to all this, but a lot of people get it mixed up with the New Age stuff. So obviously, because we're coming from, from a biblical perspective, like how do you talk about these things and think about these things from a biblical perspective as opposed to the new age perspective which it feels like it was it was hijacked i mean like just like everything else by the you know by the darkness right they hijack yeah. something and make it a counterfeit i would imagine yeah i think that's a great way to put it the truth comes first and then the lie comes after the truth as a rip off of it so actually part of the lecture that i gave on this talk was actually right about that it was about astrology versus kind of a biblical way of looking at the stars so let's just jump into it right here let's um, go why would we call it blurry skies and how could we even talk about this as blurry creatures in any meaningful way and the way that i'll get at this is by talking about mostly the stars idea of what is a star in the bible but you know the sun is a star so that would be included and then the the moon is kind of its counterpart so that would be included and then the planets which we think of as planets in the way our worldview works but they talked about them as wandering stars jude actually uses the language of wandering stars which we'll get into here in a little bit so all of these things are blurry because they are directly or indirectly mysteriously sacramentally i don't know what the right word is linked to the heavenly beings and there's several several verses to start it off with i think the most obvious one to me is job 38 7 because we've talked so much about the sons of god both i have with you guys and also a lot of your guests have and the sons of god would be these heavenly creatures that came down in genesis 6 right well job 38 7 directly links them to stars and this is the story where god is talking to job out of the whirlwind and he's questioning job where were you when i did this where were you when i did this and the whole context of that is at the very beginning of creation so man has not been created yet this is like day one day two stuff and he says that i was you know laying the foundations of the earth the pillars all this stuff and then said, so where were you when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of god shouted for joy that's classic hebrew parallelism so the morning stars are parallel to the sons of god stars gods our mind we separate them they're completely completely different from one another one is a supernatural entity if we even think about it at all the other is this ball of gas out in the night sky totally physical has no relationship to spiritual whatsoever that's not the way the bible views this psalm 108 or sorry 148 one through four praise the lord praise the lord from the heavens praise him in the heights praise him all his angels praise him all his hosts Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Same kind of an idea. How in the world is the, a ball of gas going to praise God? Because in the biblical ancient mind, these things were intimately related to each other. Another classic one is Isaiah 14, 33. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. 
This is God speaking about the king of Babylon, but behind the king of Babylon is this other creature, this heavenly being called Halel ben Shakar, this shining one, son of the dawn. And this is actually the very place where the Latin Vulgate translates it as Lucifer. So we know about Lucifer from this passage. And Lucifer says, mm. I will ascend above the stars of God. What's he talking about there? That's a divine council kind of a thing. I will, I want to, I'm going to become the ruler of the divine council. And there again, the stars are equated with heavenly beings. And there's all, all kinds of these things. Here's one that people don't often think of. This is an apocalyptic passage in Matthew 24. Uh, the Olivet Discourse, Jesus talking about kind of the end of days. And he says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and all the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So a lot of people think, well, what's that going to be? You know, some sort of a naturalistic phenomenon in the night sky. I don't think so. I think this is talking more about spiritual entities that are going to be punished for what they've done. And it uses the language of stars and powers of heaven shaking and all this kind of stuff. And then one more I'll give you is Revelation 1, because that kind of brings us to this book of Revelation and the stuff I wanted to talk about. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, Jesus says, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So here you again, you have stars being equated with these angelic beings and then closely identified down here on earth with seven churches. And that brings, that brings us to a really, really important thing to understand that a lot of people think is a pagan concept, and I'll tell you why, but I think it's actually a biblical concept that was perverted. And this goes to something that you can find this all over the place in the ancient world, but one of the more interesting to me are the emerald tablets of Toth. <laughs> Have you guys heard of that? <laughs> yeah, actually, actually, you know what's funny, Doug, is I, I put a, a note in like show notes because I had seen something about the emerald tablets wanting at some point to talk about that. But I don't know. So, yeah. I haven't done enough research on what they are, you know, how real it is or whatever, but we do have kind of a one-page summary that were supposedly written on the tablets, and they begin this way, truth, certainty, that in which there is no doubt. And then here's the key line, that which is above is from that which is below, and that mm. which is below is from that which is above. It's like a hermetic, secret society, Gnostic sort of an idea that as above, so below. If you read Graham Hancock, he's a book called Heaven's Mirror, and, and that very title is named after this idea. And we find this in the way that the ancient structures were being built to emulate the heavenly constellations, right? So yeah. probably the most famous are the three pyramids of Giza emulating Orion's belt and then mm -hmm. the, the Nile, which they're right by emulating the Milky Way galaxy. We find this with one of the serpent mounds, one that's no longer here, one that was in Florida. It was laid out according to the pattern of the constellation Serpents. We find this over in Cambodia in this famous temple called Angkor Wat, which the whole thing was laid out according to the constellation Draco. So these guys are doing this all over the place, as in heaven, so on earth. And there was this, this idea of a mirror. Heaven was supposed to be the archetype, and then earth was the thing that emulated it so that things would be in harmony or whatever. But like I said, I don't think that this is a purely pagan thing because Jesus teaches us this very thing, and he actually tells us to pray it this way in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who's in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And then what? On earth as it is in heaven. So this is, this is kind of the, the key point that I think people need to understand as we're going to talk about this astral prophecy idea and all these weird connections in Revelation that I quite honestly had never really heard very many people talk about, if anybody. Uh, and I had to really go digging and found some scholars that were willing to talk about it. And I think it's absolutely fascinating. And, and it all kind of derives from this philosophy that heaven and earth are supposed to be mirrored together. So I'll stop if you guys have things you want to say about that. It's, Doug, it's funny. Uh, you know, you say this. I was actually reading today an article about a teenager from Canada who figured out that the Mayan cities 
were laid out exactly correlated to 20 of the Mayan constellations, like literally exactly laid out. And he found missing cities because that's right. when he overlaid the Mayan constellations with the known Mayan cities, there was a few missing spots. And then when they went to find them, they found these cities, which is fa- it's fascinating to me that this is that the ancients went to such efforts to build in these exact locales on the planet, whether it is the pyramids or Angkor Wat or, and they knew some stuff enough to like be able to lay out things that you would think you'd only be able to really see from above, which is also fascinating. And it was, it was like a kid or something that discovered that, wasn't it? He was 15 years old. Yeah, he was a that's Canadian, amazing. Canadian high school kid. Yeah, and he was he was just on Google Earth, and he started <laughs> overlaying constellations, Mayan constellations. Well, we talked about that with cities. Derek too. Is that a lot of this stuff is just the way they built it in jungle areas, and it just got buried. Just got buried, yeah. yeah. And the obviously in Egypt, it's in a desert, so you can it doesn't get buried by all the the overgrowth. But I think on our last episode, we talked about at the very end, uh, we talked about how right before Christ shows up, there's a celestial event. And Christians are sort of weirded out by stars and astrology. They don't even want to talk about it. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that the ancients were, they understood it, and we don't even want to talk about it? I think a couple of reasons. One is because um, it is associated in our minds with astrology, with paganism, and that's been abused very badly. And it uses things that we're forbidden from using, and um, it's not good. So that's a, that's a perfectly understandable reason. Another one is because we've had a lot of people that have like little boys that cried wolf one too many times with these kinds of things. I think about like John Hagee and his red blood moon books and, and those kinds of things. And, and people are always wanting to put dates when they see these kinds of heavenly things. And so fool me once, fool me twice, fool me 150 times. (laughs) And it just gets old. You know, I grew up with that kind of stuff. There, There was a book. This wasn't the heavenly stuff, but it was a book on the rapture back in 1988. So this up your 80s alley. It was called 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 88. He he said in the book, you know, we can't know the day or the hour, but we can know the weekend. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it worked out real well. And then he was wrong. And then he came out with another book the next year that didn't do quite as well. 89 Reasons Why He'll Come Back in 89 (laughs) because he he missed it just by a little bit, you know? If he would have kept going, he could have gone around the horn. It could be one reason that he's coming, zero reasons he's coming back and (laughs) double zero. (laughs) Exactly. So I think people just get burned out from this kind of stuff. And I I don't want to use this for any kind of predicting of dates or whatever, but I do do want people to see that God cares about the heavens. He's put heavenly things in place on purpose. They have some kind of relationship to what goes on down here. And some of that can be prophetic, I think. Um, And I think we can prove that uh, with stuff that's already happened. Some of it might be prophetic in the future, but I don't know that any of us are smart enough to figure it out before the fact, because they really weren't before the fact then, except for a couple people. Some of it's just used symbolically, like it is metaphors for things. We'll see that here in Revelation. Other things, it, other times it's used as ways to help us understand the totality of creation, worshiping God. So we'll get into all that here as we as we get into Revelation. But Awesome. Mm. I, know, I, know, I know the famous one, Nate, that we hear all the time, Doug, as well as the, uh, you see a third of heaven, right? It's the, it's the whole idea this third of heaven fell like stars was that isn't that the um that, that's uh revelation 12 actually we'll talk okay. well, i won't get into that part of it but that's the dragon sweeping a third of the stars out of that's the sky yeah and yeah. it's funny because people think that that's talking about some kind of a fall before creation but it's not talking about that at all it's actually talking about the birth of christ go on <laughs> I hear about this. i'll get there i'll get there okay all right I told- yeah a third of angels falling is <laughs> is a lot of people come on and said that that's not really anywhere in the bible right right we got that right from- at least not an original fall i mean you've got the fall in the garden we know something happened there I, I have no problem thinking that more than one heavenly being fell there i think ezekiel a couple passages in ezekiel allude to that the king of tyre yeah and yeah. also uh the the tree the giant tree uh, the egyptian tree that the king of assyria is like it talks about the trees of eden going down to hades mm. that's also language that's akin to the stars it's talking about heavenly beings there so yeah there was a fall there i don't think it, i don't think the fall was before man i think it was because of man all right so let's go to revelation chapter 2 and 3 so this is this is the i'll just kind of go through the chapters in order this is the two chapters with the seven churches. 
You've got Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Seven is a very interesting number. We've already seen that these things are the seven golden lampstands, and that somehow they're related to the seven angels, right? So somebody speculated that maybe there's a layout there on the ground of how these, how and why these cities were put there. This could also be a heaven mirror thing. And if you overlay the Pleiades with the seven churches, you get about five and a half of the stars are in exactly the right place of where the of where the uh, oh. seven cities are. One of them's kind of off, and then one of them's kind of out in nowhere. I think that's really interesting that that it's possible that they were actually laying out that whole complex and cities according to the Pleiades, and they were somehow remembering or worshiping things that took place long ago or hmm. entities that were put over that specific area. And there's lots of different possibilities for that. But the Pleiades are seven stars. And so that's why I bring that up. But um, in this passage, you get these weird talks about all these false prophets and false teachers that these churches are supposed to be aware of. Okay. And I'll start off here with this verse from Jude, because Jude uses the same language for the same kind of thing. He says, these people blaspheme. And so he's talking about false teachers. Woe to them. They are wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. So a wandering star in the ancient mind was, there was seven of them. And these were the seven objects in the night sky that didn't work and operate the way that the rest of the stars did. All the rest of the stars are fixed. They never change. Now they move over the night sky, but the seven wandering stars are moving all over the place. These are the five planets that you can see with your naked eye. So Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and then the sun and the moon. So those are the seven wandering stars of the ancient world. And it's interesting because they're all named after deities, every last one of them, even the sun and the moon. And they were all worshipped in the ancient world. So that's blurry creature stuff right there. Yeah, hmm. yeah, it is. All right. Now, what's interesting is that each one of these seven churches has something associated with one of the seven star wandering stars. Some of them are harder to see than others, but let's just kind of go in order. The largest city of Asia Minor is Ephesus. Okay, so of the seven churches, Ephesus is the biggest one. It's the biggest site of commerce and th that kind of stuff. And John says to the angel of the church at Smyrna, right, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. So he's directly talking about the lampstand, which we've already seen is related to these heavenly angels. And this is the largest of these cities. And so it would correspond to the sun. Smyrna is like the moon because it waxes and it wanes. And you get this with the language of first and last, died, come to life, died, come to life. So if you go and read that mm. little section, uh, it's like Smyrna is waxing and waning like the moon. Pergamum is much easier to see because this corresponds to Mars and Mars or Aries is the god of war. And so to this church, Jesus talks about how he has the sharp two-edged sword. And if they don't repent, he's going to war against Pergamum with the sword of his mouth. So Pergamum corresponds to Mer uh, Mars. Thyatira corresponds to Venus most directly because Venus is the morning star. And it says to Thyatira, it actually uses the language of morning star with Thyatira. Sardis is corresponding to Mercury. Mercury was the god of thieves. And Jesus says, if you will not wake up, I will come to you like a thief and you won't know what hour I will come against you. Jupiter corresponds to Philadelphia because Jupiter is the king of planets. And this is the only church that Jesus mentions a king. And he says, I am the one who hold the key of David. David's the king. And then the last one, Laodicea, corresponds to Saturn. Saturn was known in astronomy for its sluggish motion. And this is the church that Jesus talks about as being lukewarm, wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, naked, sluggish. So that's not coincidental. Something's happening there. What's going on? So I think what's happening is that 
in this particular instance in Revelation, John is using the seven wandering stars as an illustration, maybe more than an illustration, of the false teachers that are in their midst. And these false teachers are people that are part of the synagogue of Satan or, you know, that kind of supernatural language. They're teaching demonic doctrines. And so, Mm -hmm. if the church doesn't wake up, they are going to emulate not the stars, but the wandering stars. And this is a bad thing. Doug, do you think that, like, historically speaking, that there was something going on in these planets before creation of man? I've kicked around that idea, Nate. You know, there's a, there's a missing planet between Mars uh, and Jupiter. Yeah. And right where that Ray, planet is. Rahab, a, as Tim Albrino says. <laughs> right, where, right where that planet is, there's a giant meteor belt. Well, you, it made me think of it because you were talking about how you know, Christ is going to bring war to Mars. And so many people have sent us videos and clips of things and pictures that looks like there's destruction left on Mars. Yeah, it like does. Like there was some yep. sort of ancient war that happened there. There's been several people that have taken very seriously the whole Cydonia uh, part of Mars, thinking that it was uh, not a natural formations that somebody built up there and that hmm. something cataclysmic happened. So I don't, I don't rule that out. It looks like a wasteland, kind of. It does. It very much. But I mean, so, anyway, just I just <laughs> thinking about that from from the extent of prehistory, prehuman history, how maybe they some of these people had knowledge of things that would happen before, and humans just were playing with like a few cards, and they got a whole deck, you know? Oh yeah. All right. So that's chapters two and three. Chapter four and five are interesting because this is like the this is the worship scene, the heavenly scene where. The lamb and God on the throne are being worshipped, and they're being worshipped by these four living creatures. And these four living creatures have these heads, these faces. One is an ox, one is an eagle, one is a man, Mm. and one is a lion. And it's like, this is really bizarre. What in the world's going on here? Mm. So, that that imagery comes from Ezekiel chapter 1, where the exact same thing is going on. And you have these living creatures that are uh, surrounded by wheels and more wheels, wheels and wheels. And they bow down and they worship God. So, what would that be? In certain circles, people think that this is talking about a UFO. It's not talking about a UFO. It's talking about the night sky. And it's talking about the four cardinal points of the zodiac, the four cardinal constellations. You've got Taurus, Aquarius, the man. You've got Leo, the lion. And you've got Dan is the uh, serpent. And the serpent was in ancient times known as the eagle. So, you've got a reference here to the constellations, the zodiac. And when you, in Ezekiel, the wheel that's spinning, if you were to take a time-lapse picture and point your camera right at the North Star, and then over the night sky, you would see the stars revolving around in a circle. And they end up creating wheels within wheels within wheels, because it's the, it's the sky going around this, this pinpoint of the North Star. Mm. And that's what he's describing. And what, what he's saying is that all of God's creation is worshiping the lamb. And it's no coincidence that in, I think it's chapter five, the lamb is also called the lion of the tribe of Judah. Lion of Judah. And that's where that comes from. So that has an origin. And this takes us on a little bit of diversion that we need to talk about, which is that God was doing a heavenly mirror thing with Israel in the Old Testament. So if you go to, Genesis 49 is the, is the starting point of this. This is where Jacob is giving his last will and testament to his 12 sons. And he calls out several of the sons and he identifies them really weirdly. He calls Reuben the man, the firstborn, and, it, and water is, is part of that prophecy. He calls Judah the lion, the lion's whelp. And he says that the king, the staff will not depart from that. He calls Dan a serpent and he calls uh, Joseph, who ends up becoming Manasseh later, a bull in the Targum. And you can find the bull also, I think, in Deuteronomy. So, that ends up transforming into something in the tabernacle, okay? So, God has Israel going around and round and round for 40 years in the wilderness. And they have to camp around the tabernacle. Tabernacle's right in the dead center. And when they're camping around the tabernacle, he has them camp in very specific places. 
So Judah has to camp right at the entrance of the tent on the east side. And Judah is the lion. And then you've got Dan who has to camp on the north side. And you've got Manasseh who has to camp on the west side. And you've got Reuben who camps on the south side. And what you end up with there is that Israel is emulating the constellations on earth through their tribes, 12 tribes, 12 constellations, four cardinal tribes, four cardinal constellations, north, south, east, west. And in the middle you know, of, of the heavenlies is the sun. And in the middle of Israel is the tabernacle where the king sits, the son of God, the son of the mm-hmm. S-U-N of righteousness that Malachi calls him. So what's happening is that God is doing something on earth through his chosen people that they are going to kind of take the place of the heavenly beings because the heavenly beings fell. And so he's going to start over and do something new with his people. And on earth, they are going to be the ones who will be doing the ruling, which is what it was supposed to be all along, but Adam fell into sin. And then you come along to the very end of Daniel and Daniel starts talking about how the saints will be like the stars of God. And they will essentially in eternity take the place of these fallen watchers as kind of the punishment for what they've done and and as really as glorification for what Christ the God man did. And then in saving his people, they will end up, Paul says, judging angels. Hmm, it's wild. And you think about the idea that the, that the temple is an effigy of a mountain. And we talk about how they, they do that across the ancient world as well. They create these, these artificial mountains. The temple as it was built in Israel, but also the tabernacle, if I'm correct, was like a was essentially an effigy of a mountain as well. So you have this like Mount Zion that God dwells on the, on top of the mountain. Yeah, it gets it gets it, within all of that too, which is wild. Like the tabernacle is a little harder to see, but you can see it. So like you've got the gold that always is up, and you got the bronze that's always touching the ground, and you got silver that's always in the middle. Uh-huh. Those are kinds of ideas of heavenly earthly with the bronze and in the middle, the middle realm is where the silver belongs. So you definitely have a picture. Uh, You get it with the Garden of Eden imagery on the curtains where you've got these cherubim and all, you know, the animals on the altar that they were supposed to put in there. That's the whole thing is echoing Eden and Eden itself was mountain. You know, if you go back Mm. to Ezekiel 28, that very clearly flowed down out of Eden. Absolutely. So it's a cosmic mountain that's going on there. We talked to Tim Mackey about that. That was yep. you know, one of our fascinating episodes. So by design, the camp of Hebrews was was laid out to emulate the night sky by the right by order. It was meant to Yep. And that's it's the whole idea that it as it's it's not the as on as earth as in heaven. Is it, it is, is it that? Or yeah. is it But what was your okay. or going to be? No, because I know that that's like that's also been repurposed and counterfeited right to to you know like you said like the secret societies and even the graham hancock stuff that there's like this sort of inverse side of the coin here's a way that it's perverted i think so you have to go back to tower babel for this so the cosmic mountain the original cosmic mountain is the place of eden where god himself comes down he creates man he walks with them in the in the garden he gives them the law they're supposed to obey him they're supposed to do what he says Tower of Babel is the anti-Eden because they're creating a a man-made mountain. They were not given permission to do it. They're trying to ascend to the stars. They're trying to somehow connect with the heavenly beings on their own terms to use those powers for their own purposes. And that's completely forbidden. And that's completely forbidden. So uh, what the tabernacle is doing is it's God again coming down to Israel and commanding them to do this. And it's not going to be them trying to reach up to the gods. Instead, the the 12 tribes are actually taking the place of those constellations, of those gods. Hmm. And in their midst, 
will be Yahweh, who they are supposed to follow with their whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Hmm. Obeying his law, him being their king in their midst, him leading them where they would go. So the tabernacle is really kind of a return to Eden, and it's the exact opposite of what they were doing at Tower Babel. So if you think about what they were doing with their uh, pagan sanctuaries, their pyramids, their temple complexes, I believe that they were doing the same stuff that they were doing at Babel, where they were emulating the stars and particular gods so that they could somehow capture the power of that god or interact with it or whatever the case might be. Hmm. It's kind of like... Everyone's playing the chess game. They're moving their pieces. They're putting their pieces in strategic places. And the Israelites are too. And they, they're they warring each other, obviously. But they're they're sort of on the same turf, the same earth. Now we're in this age where we just we have no idea how they set up the board back then. <laughs> For sure. And so there's this there's war. And I think that's that seems to echo just like the spiritual war we have going on in all things. And to that point, I think it's interesting that like you talk, we talk about the pyramids like like Orion, and then these cities, even like the Pleiades, and in the ancient aliens world now, and in, in the ancient world then, there's this talk that certainly these entities were from those places, right? Like these entities were from the the belt of Orion, from one of the stars in the belt of Orion, and these entities were from the Pleiades, right? The, the we talked about this on a couple shows where they believe these aliens, what entities, whatever you want to call them, come down. It's it's fascinating to me these particular places also have this lore or uh, association i mean not accidentally with these entities that you know if you en- you end up on on a, on the other side of the fence when it comes to the ancient aliens kind of theory stuff you you say these people came and then they were they were here and that's why they did this but it sounds a lot more like table of nations stuff to me and you know these sons of god being placed over these people groups and then there's sort of this homage to you know, to the representation of them in the stars i maybe i'm no i think that's exactly what's going on and you remember that uh when god gave the nations the sons of god and put them over them that was something that he did he gave them to them so the sons of god actually inherit the nations as their inheritance from the father if you want to put it that way so it was a legal right that they had and what the war is is because they were evil and they didn't rule well and they ruled wickedly and they they taught people to worship themselves instead of the creator, the war becomes this war of the seeds where Jesus ends up overthrowing them, creating a whole new group of sons of God, which are humans that are saved by him, that become part of his family. Hmm. And that becomes the war. And so in Revelation, Revelation 4 and 5 is so important because you don't see in that chapter the stars being rebellious, you see them all falling down and bowing before God and doing what they're supposed to do. (laughs) Mm. They're worshiping him because all things are being made right. So this might be a dumb question, but I'm sure listeners are wondering if, if God sets up these nations with these other lesser G's to rule over them, does, is the, is the idea for them to rule justly? I mean, but does, I mean, does God know they're going to rule poorly? Dr. Heiser talks about it as, he talks about it as punitive punishment. So we deserve them and they deserve us. And God knows full well that they're going to rule wickedly. And so he punishes them for it later. It's kind of like uh, when God sends the Babylonian to destroy the Israelites in the captivity. And then later he sends, or before that, he sends the Assyrians to do the same thing to the Northern Kingdom. He knows full well that they're completely wicked, evil people, but he's judging his people through another evil people. And that evil people doesn't get off the hook just because he sent them to do the job because they didn't mm. obey his law. They they were completely wicked in what they did, and they end up getting their own punishment later on. Uh, the judgment comes, yeah. Mm. Yep. Interesting. Fascinating. I'm, I'm continue on. <laughs> okay. Let's go to chapter six. I, I'm, I've been debating how much of this do I want to get into because I already did it for the yeah. other thing, and I'd like people to actually go and be a part of that, but I do want to mention something in chapter six. So this is the four horsemen of the apocalypse chapter. And what you have is in that, in that chapter, you have one of the four living creatures calling out to one of the horsemen. And the long story short is that you have, if you look at a Zodiac and then you, you line up the four horsemen to particular others of the eight other constellations, you can actually line them up and they fit perfectly. One's Virgo, one is Sagittarius. 
couple others. And you have this uh, speaking of, so like the lion to one of those guys and then the man to one of those guys and then the eagle to one of them, the ox to one of them. And when you look at it on a Zodiac on a clock, you end up having a reversal you're going backwards around the clock from where one is speaking to the other, it's going backwards. And so it's, I mean, the whole thing is completely fascinating and really strange, but I think what's going on there is that there's theological messaging happening. So it starts, you know, on the right, instead of the, you know, if you look at a clock, a regular clock, the hands are going to the right. In this case, the hands would be going to the left. In other words, time is going backwards. And I think that the messaging going on there is that through these heavenly beings and however they're related to the four horsemen of the apocalypse, God is going to be doing a decreation on this earth. He's going to be undoing what he has done mm. through the punishment of these writers that are somehow connected to the heavenly realm. They're going to be undoing creation, which is what war is all about, right? I mean, it's a it's a destruction of civilization. It's an undoing of order, all those kinds of things. But um, that comes across pretty clearly when you understand that that John isn't leaving behind any of this astronomical stuff that he's been talking about. He's continuing with it as he moves through his through his book. So you think if they're building these these structures on Earth, aligning with say these constellations that they're kind of welcoming in whatever entity it is, it's sort of a because like we talk about on the show a lot, Doug is like a lot of these things you can't see on the ground. You have to you know, now that we have drones and stuff, we can fly right. we can see like how did they know how to build this stuff right. from an aerial view? And is it sort of like a welcome like a welcome note? Like come on down, hang out with us. Thousand percent. Yep. And it's an acknowledgement that there were very particular entities that were put over specific geographical regions. So we can take a kind of a, a bunny trail here and talk for a minute about some stuff that's pretty, pretty fascinating with this that I don't think I've told you guys about before. So if you look, if you look into the history of how they created the prime meridian, which is this zero longitude and, and you have to have longitude in order to be able to navigate the seas. So you had to fix your longitude to a certain place. At one point in time, the longitude, the primary was in Paris, and then it moved just slightly west to Greenwich, England. And there was Greenwich, first of all, is short for green witch. So there's some weird stuff going on there and it's all astronomically based. So if you go back and you read the myth of the guy holding up the pillars, Atlas. Hmm. Atlas is holding up the pillars um, to keep heaven and earth from colliding into one another. So that's actually quite related to the as in heaven, so on earth thing. Hmm. Well, there's a geographical location that is called the mountains of Atlas that happens to be right over the northwestern corner of Africa. And when you draw a line through the prime meridian, straight down, you go right through the pillars of Atlas. So mm. the prime meridian is being somehow tethered to this spot in mythology that it was believed that heaven and earth are being held apart from one another. When you do that, then you can start fixing the constellations over very specific parts of the night sky. So for example, just above the Atlas Mountains in Europe, there, there would be a constellation that is fixed right over the top of them, and that would be the, the Gemini Twins. And what's so strange about it is that the Gemini Twins happen to, and I forget the exact, the exact way this works, but they happen to have their feet right where Italy is. And of course, Italy itself looks like a boot. Everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. And the founding mm -hmm. myth of Rome is that it was founded by these twins. Yeah. So what's going on with that? You can go farther to the east and you can see that when you fix your prime meridian there, that you have Orion happens to be just about over Egypt, right? Where the pyramids are. You find that to the north and to the east of that up in Turkey, you have the Taurus Mountains. And that's right where Taurus, the constellation, would be fixed to. So we're not moving anything around. You can go to the west, oh. and if you go, if you go, you know, obviously you go west of Europe, you end up in the Atlantic Ocean. But if you go far enough west, and then south, right where Leo is, 
you have the city of Cusco down in South America, in Peru. And the mm. city of Cusco is laid out to look like a puma. The whole grid, it looks like a puma. Well, they have pumas in the megaliths, They've in the rock. Yeah, absolutely. And well, it's because Leo is sitting directly over Cusco. You can go to uh, Washington, D.C., and you can see that Washington, D.C. is surrounded by three places, Maryland, Virginia, and Annapolis. And think of the roots of all those, Mary land, Virgin, yeah, Anna, Polis. Well, those are all like surrounding the idea of Virgo and also in some ways the Virgin Mary, which in, in kind of a paganization of who Mary is, which is really what Rome has done, uh, you get overlaps with Mary and Virgo. Well, Virgo happens to dominate over the eastern two-third of the United States. And D.C., Virgo in, in Mary is a representation of the divine female, which we know is is the t- pinnacle top Absolutely. of the of Masonic religion. Is they have the divine female, right? And then we know the DC is laid out by Masons very specifically, and it's completely crazy the way it's laid out. And there are, apparently there's more uh, zodiacs in Washington DC than just about anywhere. And the primary sign on those zodiacs is Virgo. So. You can go across the whole earth and you can do this and you can see that all the ancient peoples and even until, I guess, the illuminated peoples in modern days, they know what's going on here and they're tethering their place to the stars that are above it. And I think it's exactly what you said, Nate. There's reasons why they're doing that. One is legitimate because God put them over, put the beings over them, but others are illegitimate because they're trying to contact them and and worship them and get power from them or whatever else the case is. Well, it's weird if you do get into like the abduction phenomenon, but they all say when they're communicating with these entities, they're from a different place, from a different star. And there's no cohesion on where these people come from. So it sounds like there's a people coming from who knows where, and they all say they're from some different area or some part of the solar system. And so it kind of aligns with what you're, what you're saying that, there are multiple locations and they are building megalithic structures to their their constellation and specific geological location. And I think sometimes when on our show, just things like, why do they pick these spots? They just pick random spots. There's nothing random about anything. No, that the especially state. not with the ancient world and especially not when you're when you're taking decades to build cities and temple complexes. Yeah. I mean, hundreds of years. Yeah, and something. yeah and, and so, absolutely. Doug, I got a question for you. So, I mean, we we talking about all this stuff is astral prophecy, right? The, the prophetic imagery of the heavens and tied tied to the God of the universe and, and to you know prophetically predicting things and, and what's to come. Can we talk about the other side of that, like with astrology, right? Because there's this this idea that the stars can fortune tell, which we is why I think the church and, and most Christians are like, whoa, stay away from that. It's like, that's that's kind of witchcraft. And not even kind of, that's really what it is in some ways, right? And so why do you think that, I want to unpack that just a little bit because we haven't really talked about that. The idea that, that the scriptures are using in the heavens, is it just at the most basic? Is it a counterfeit? Is that what we're talking about? Like that is this this idea that like that as earth is in heaven and in heaven then will then predict what happens on earth and that's that's where it lives but it's it's you know it's twisted obviously because if we're talking about metaphorically speaking the, these stars are also entities then you're born under a set of stars and under a set of entities right. and that sort of dictates right. your future right it's just, it's just right. very strange removing god from the equation or, or god from from being sitting on the throne really and, and being in control of your destiny and somehow it's not as the stars maybe i just answered my question by saying that but so i think at its best uh, well, let's not take astrology at its worst. Let's take it at its best. I liken it in a lot of ways to contacting the dead and how that's forbidden in the law of Moses. Don't do necromancy. Don't go after mediums mm-hmm. and spiritists. Don't do that. And the, and the reason isn't because it's fake. It's because it's forbidden. Mm. Okay. Mm. So, at its best, you could say that astrology, like, let's just assume for sake of argument that people were born under a sign, okay? And that that sign had something to do with their life. I'm not saying I believe that. I actually don't think that I do believe that. But if we took it for sake of argument, there's something that's that's just terribly against the gospel with that. Because what 
what the Lord does through the gospel is he breaks the power of those entities that are Mm -hmm. over you. And so, to consult back with them is to go back to a position of slavery to Satan. Come on now. When you've been set free from Christ. Mm -hmm. So, there's no reason to do it. And in fact, it's a slap in the face to what Christ did for us when when we go back and we do that kind of stuff. Wow. So, so here's a thought. Well, that's good. I, I love that, though. Like that, that, I think people need to hear that, Nate, before you say that. that people need to hear that because I know that there are some people who get kind of like sort of willy-nilly or wishy-washy. Like it's kind of fun. Read your horoscope. But what we're talking about is actually it is re-enslaving yourself to the wishes of, you know, of, of an entity in, instead of living under the freedom of Christ. Yeah, and you have to understand that Christ has set us free from not just sin and death, but also Satan himself. Well, here's a thought, Doug, that kind of goes along with all this. Let's say people were fixated on, you were talking about the, the fixed constellations, and then the planets were the moving stars? The planets are the wandering stars, yep. Wandering stars. So when Christ shows up, is the star in heaven, the star over Bethlehem, outside of all that, a sign to all these fixed stars I'm going to move this this one that you've never seen before right in the middle of all this. Oh, that's a great question. That's a total lead in, man. It's great. It's great. It's perfect. <laughs> Let's go to Revelation 12 because that's the perfect question. Look at you, Val. Look at you. Like you've done a podcast before, Nate. <laughs> hey, 130 episodes. I hope we, we know what we're doing a little bit. All right. I want to read Revelation 12 and just part of it and just we'll read it, get a, get, get a sense for what it's talking about. It says, and a great sign appeared in heaven. All right. What have we been talking about? We've been talking about the heavens. Okay, John's had this in his mind since chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, chapter five, chapter six. Now we're in chapter 12. Here's the sign. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains, in the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns on his heads, seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven. So there's where we get that. And cast them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child who is to rule all the nations with the rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she's to be nourished for 1260 days. And then it goes on. So what in the world is going on? People talk about Matthew having a birth story of Jesus. People talk about Luke Luke having a birth story of Jesus. People say John doesn't have a birth story of Jesus. I actually think John has two birth stories. One is in John 1, where the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. That's important because that's that's a hearkening to the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles takes place in September every year, okay? Revelation 12 is the other birth story of Jesus. And that's really important to see the context because this is, it's very obvious who the child is. And this is Psalm 2, he was gonna rule the nations with the rod of iron, it's her child. And he was caught up to God, to his throne. What's that talking about? This time about the birth of the Messiah, And then it's talking about his ascension after he's dead and been raised from the dead. And so then the rest of that chapter is really about the woman going out into the wilderness and the dragon goes after her to seek to devour, to kill her, right? So how does this match up then with the birth of Jesus? Well, this is where the sign in heaven comes in. You have a woman clothed with the sun. And by the way, there's a lots of scholarship on this. And Dr. Heiser has a, I don't know, 11, 12 minute, YouTube video that you can go up and look at the astronomy of what I'm about ready to say. So this starts with, it's, it starts, first of all, I think, Nate, with your star, okay? There was a prophecy that Balaam, the pagan prophet, said that a star is going to come out of Jacob. And that star is the one who's going to rule the nations. This is back in number, the book of Numbers. You go to the book of Daniel, and in the book, in the book of Daniel, we find that Daniel, this is really interesting. He's the chief astrologer of Babylon, given that position by Nebuchadnezzar. And it's not looked at as an evil thing. It's looked at as a fine thing because it's a guy who worships God. He's not going to use it for evil purposes. All right. So when Jesus is born in Matthew 2, you have this star. 
And the Magi know that this star is here somehow. And these Magi come from the East. Where are they coming from? I think they're coming from Babylon. Why are they coming from Babylon? I think it's because that's where Israel was in exile for 70 years. And many of them stayed after that. And this is where Daniel was brought when he was in exile. And Daniel knew the prophecies and he knew how to look at the signs. I mean, no culture in history had ever been as good at understanding the heavens as the Babylonians. He's the chief astrologer of Babylon. They were astrologers par excellence. Nobody even comes close. And here Daniel is the chief over them. So how could the Magi know about this star? I think it's because of prophecy and because of the, the scripture. And I think what John's going to do here is going to unpack it for us. So the woman clothed with the sun is Virgo. All right. Constellation Virgo. She's the only constellation that even matches. You would have to have a, in a star alignment where the sun is going to be clothing her. So somewhere in her belly makes the most sense because she's pregnant. And the moon is under her feet. So you got to have a time when the sun is at one, one place in Virgo and then the moon is right under her feet. And that can happen even though you might not be able to see the moon. It's still there, even though it's daytime, right? Mm. Yep. And they have a crown of 12 stars on her head. She's crying out in birth pains. And then another sign is appearing and you have this great, red dragon, which would be one of four options. The most likely one is that it's Draco. And it's a, it's a scene of the constellations where essentially Draco is trying to stop Virgo from giving birth. And there's some other things that are going on here where you've got this kind of king star, which is Jupiter. And you have this king, uh, uh, sorry, king star would be Regulus, which is in Leo the lion which is right next to Virgo. And then you have Jupiter, which is the wandering star, which is the king planet. And was there ever a time when the sun and the moon and Jupiter and Regulus were all lined up in perfect position, according to what Revelation 12 says? And the answer to that is, yes, there was. And through astronomical software, we know that it only happened once within centuries on either side of that occurrence. And that date is going to blow you guys away. Have you guys heard this before? <laughs> so no. the date was uh 3 bc september 11th i was gonna say birth of christ i was gonna say september 11th september 11th probably. so prior Which is why people think that's when christ was born. that's right and this is the reason why it's because this is astral prophecy being put into a kind of a historical form that the that these guys knew what they were looking at they were looking for conjunction of the king planet the king star the sun and the moon in virgo giving birth and they they could predict this decades ahead of time they didn't have a problem with that that's how good they were at this they didn't need astronomical software because <laughs> this is what mm. they did for a living and so when, when that time was approaching they were headed to the place of bethlehem because micah predicted that and uh, they knew the scripture and they went to go worship the king. And so when he was born, so it's not like this, uh, it's not like just some sort of a little uh, a star that's walking <laughs> with them as they're going, showing the light mm -hmm. like 10 feet over their head or something. It's an astronomical alignment. This makes me think about how the human body, the, the spirit of every human is bound to the flesh, right? We're, we're spirits, but we have this fleshly body, right? And one day we're going to get, you know, uh, heavenly bodies. But are these territories sort of like the the stars are sort of like the spirit and and their territory is sort of this body and they're kind of stuck to each other. So if Christ is outside of time and the star rolls on to the scene, the sort of outside of this astrological fixation where everything's sort of structured and it's constantly repeating itself but Christ rolls in when everything's aligned, but also this, this 
do you think this star was sort of an anomaly? Like it, it's not following, it's not doing what it should do. And it's like maybe a mirror of like Christ is going to, because he's outside of time, because he is the creator, he's going to all your limitations, all your, you know, your, your little territory is stuck to this little entity. Well, I'm, I'm greater than all of that. It's kind of the visual that I'm sort of thinking and getting in my mind as I, as I see the night with the star over Bethlehem. So, yeah, again, I think that the star Nate was actually the whole alignment itself, the whole thing where Jupiter is in a very specific spot. Regulus is it. Of course, it doesn't move. The sun is in a very specific spot in Virgo, right in the middle of her womb. And then the moon is at her feet. I mean, these things are moving all the time. So it actually, there was actually only like a two or three hour period on that day when that would have even been the case. And then they would have moved out of it. Hmm. So um, they're looking for that. What the wise men had been following it for a while. Then, sure. too, well, also. they knew exactly when it was going to happen. That's what I'm saying. Like they had yeah, because the, they had the best astrology. They had the uh, instrumentation yeah. to be able to to uh, be able to predict these things perfectly, hmm. hundred years in advance if they wanted to. Okay, but I also think it's also interesting that this means that God would have had to have set this up prior to the creation of man. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's like all the clues are right there, but they can't figure it out. Right. I love that though. But they did know to kill, start killing the kids, though, right? They did know. Herod, well, but who did he talk to? Herod was talking to those guys. Like, why are you here? Well, we've here, come here to worship. Well, who is he? And then Herod, Herod's smart enough to figure out that uh, he could be in trouble because this guy could take his throne away from him. Throne, that's right. Mm. So it's kind of like they know, but they don't know where. Uh-huh. And that's the mystery they, of Jesus throughout, right? I mean, <laughs> when he's a kid. They don't know when he's born. Most people don't know when he's right in front of them. They don't know. (laughs) Hmm. It's only looking backwards that we get kind of the best picture of it. I mean, what a big picture though, right? Like you think about that God set these things into motion to align at the time that he had, he had appointed to send his son and he set all of these stars and these, in these orbits and all into motion. And so, I mean, just to draw the, the the conclusion then that somehow these things have influence over your lives and not the creator who put them into motion. Yeah, it's yeah, is really the deception of, of really astrology, is. right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. You, you think about just the the master's touch there in in aligning, and the fact that the heavens then predict those things of God because He set them in motion, and then the idea that astrology then predicts the things of the darkness. Really, I mean, honestly, over over. It's it's really an amazing juxtaposition. I, I I love sort of those two things on opposite ends, realizing that that the darkness just just counterfeits. It just it just pretends that it has it has any any power, right? The the real power lies with the King of Kings and the uncreated one, the one who said, I am who I am. And the one who all the stars are bowing down to worship. That's right. That's right. Well Jesus talks about falling stars and heavens being shaken, right? Right. And I don't think that that's natural phenomenon because that wouldn't even make sense. Like we know that if a star was to come within a light year of earth, we would all be dead, let alone fall into our atmosphere. That's talking about the powers, the heavenly hosts, the rulers of this age, the principalities, the thrones, they are being shaken. Isaiah 24, 21 through 24 really talks about this and says, God's going to punish the host of heaven in heaven and then the, the kings of the earth on earth. And that language is shaking of the stars. So, yeah, it's a punishment of the fallen watchers, really. Hmm. Hmm. You guys want me to give you one more? Yeah. Give it, give it to us. All right. Take another. It takes us to the end of the book. These are kind of related. I guess I'll give you two, but they're kind of related. So, in uh, Revelation 21, you have the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from, he- from heaven. And I heard growing up that uh, people were actually could see this with a telescope. <laughs> they saw that it was on its way to earth. I'm sorry that if that happened, we're all toast because this thing is a 1200 miles width, 1200 miles in length and 1200 miles tall. And if that thing hits earth, we're all dead. It sounds like a sci-fi thing, like for the board. Kind of <laughs> totally. It's cube. a board cube, man. Yeah, yeah. The Kaaba, by the way, in Islam is a black cube. And it's kind of like the anti cube of revelation 21. And it's also moon worship, by the way. Not surprising. So this cube, one of the one of the predominating features of it when you read that chapter is that it has all these twelves associated with it. 
And those 12s are related to the 12 tribes and then to the 12 apostles. And this is because Jesus is now doing something through this cube, which he calls the bride of Christ. So the cube is actually his church and it's being symbolized through this geometry. And the church is now going to emulate the heavens in a perfect way. And this is where it gets kind of crazy. All right. So you have these dimensions that are part of what it is to, to be a cube. And these dimensions are related to the sun and the moon. And so just kind of long story short, if you take some of the numbers and, and I could go through this in detail, not sure if I want to do that because I'm not sure how well it translates on, on a radio podcast. But if you look at some of the numbers, like for example, 12,000 furlongs, which is a furlong is, I think that's the way the King James translates it. If you read like modern translations, they'll say a stadia. These are all related to each other. All these dimensions, like an inch, a foot, a pace, a stadia or furlong, they're all related to the human body. So like an inch is the length of the tip of your thumb to the middle knuckle. And a foot is the average length of a person's foot in those days. And a pace is how far it would be from the back of your foot. If you took one step and then another step and went back to the very same pace at the end of your foot, that's how long that is into being a yard. Okay. Cool. And a mile is mille. So it's like a mile is a thousand paces and 12,000 furlongs. Okay. So all these things are related to the human being, our bodies. Man is the measure of all things as, as the ancient saying goes. 12,000 furlongs equals 7,920,000 feet. Who cares? Well, the earth in miles, and remember mile is a, is a related, uh, a related measurement based on human human being the earth in miles is 7920 miles so 7000 7, 920000 feet 7920 miles there's a one to one correspondence there same thing happens with regard to the number of sides and right angles in a cube there's 24 right angles in a cube right angles 90 degrees multiply those out you get 2160 this happens to be the diameter of the moon hmm doesn't sound like an accident. Yeah. So you get you get these weird things going on with this cube where it's related somehow to the earth, it's related to the moon. There's other measurements where it's related to the distance between the earth and the sun. All kinds of weird things are going on because as in heaven, so on earth. Mm. And what God is doing again is he's he's creating his church to take over for what these heavenly beings have have fallen short of, and we will end up ruling like the stars of heaven, as Daniel said. So that's one thing that's pretty interesting. And then you get the last thing I want to talk about is an age. So this is something I, I actually brought up. I was listening to the, our discussion on Atlantis, and I brought this up at the very end of that. And I was glad I did. People can go back and listen to that. Uh, it's near the end of that episode. And we were talking about procession of the equinoxes, yeah. procession of the great year. What this is, is that, you know, a solar year is determined by how many days it takes for the sun to get back to the same spot, 365 and a quarter days. That's a solar year. There's also something called a great year. And in the great year, the earth, because when it spins, it doesn't spin perfectly vertically. It spins like a top that's about, that's starting to fall over. And so it's north, the north pole of the earth is constantly shifting over the course of a kind of a, a circle, this takes 26,000 years, 25,788 years for it to make one cycle when it does that. Mm. You can approximate this, that if you take the year and divide it by 12, you end up getting 2,160 again. That's the diameter of the moon. That's those right angles in a cube. This is how long it takes for the earth to go one twelfth of the way through the great year. Okay. And the one twelfth of the year is important because that would be a great month or what they call a platonic month, 2,160. It's a symbolic number, but it's a, it's pretty close to what it would be. Now, if you go out in the night sky, the 12 constellations are a little bit different in size from each other. So some are a little bigger, some are a little smaller, but the way that the Greeks talked about this was that you, you move from one age to the next age. And 
the way this is measured is that when you, you you go out like on the summer solstice, okay, and you look at a specific time like midnight, and you see when what constellation is pointing due east, and for two thousand one hundred and sixty years, the same constellation. If you go out on that same day every year, it's going to be relatively speaking that constellation that you're going to see, and then the next two thousand one hundred and sixty will be one of the it will be the next one in the in the twelve. Mm. So right now we are in the constellation of Pisces, and this is the fish. Okay, and Christians were known as uh, little fishes. Jesus has said, "I'm going to make you fishers of men." Um, baptismal pools were called fish ponds. All kinds of weird fish things associated with Christianity. They would, uh, you know, even today we see the ichthus, which is a an acronym for Jesus Christ, God, Lord, our Savior, something like that. And that's a fish, and you see that on the back of people's cars. Well, what is that? Where does that come from? I believe it comes from Pisces, because when Jesus came, he was essentially ushering in the age of Pisces, and they called mm -hmm. it an age. Okay, so when you move from one age to the next, when it comes to a great year, you're moving from one constellation to the next. Now, it just so happens that the next constellation, in order of the great year, it goes backwards from a solar year. So. In a solar year, Pisces is followed by Aries, but in the great year, Pisces is followed by Aquarius because it's going backwards. So that song, Age of Aquarius, yeah, is yeah. it's marking this idea that we're right at the cusp of moving out of Pisces and into Aquarius. So into this, we have Revelation 20 and Jesus talk, uh, uh, talking about the John talking about the millennium. Satan will be bound for a thousand years. So I, I I have a little bit different eschatology than most people. I'm not a premillennialist at this point. I used to be. Premillennialism is where you essentially believe that there's going to be a future thousand years that's preceded by a terrible, terrible time, like a tribulation. That thousand years will be like this perfect harmony and bliss. And then at the end of that, there will be something terrible will happen, and then the, in the heavenly state will be ushered in. Okay. This is where they get the thousand years from. So I hold to, to something a little bit different. It's more like a it's more like a spiritualization of that thousand years because none of the numbers in Revelation are literal. They're all symbolic. And in that text, it says that Satan is bound for a very specific reason. He's bound from deceiving the nations. He can no longer deceive the nations during this thousand years. Well, that's exactly what we've been seeing happen for 2,000 years since Pentecost. Prior to Pentecost, the nations were being deceived. Now, the nations are no longer being deceived. They're being saved. And we've spent this whole show talking about how important that is. So, what Revelation says is that at the end of that thousand years, Satan will be released to wreak havoc, and then you know God will um, swoop in and he'll save his people, and then the essentially the eternal state will happen. So, in other places, in Paul and uh, other parts of the New Testament, they talk about two ages. We live in the present age, which is sometimes called the e present evil age, and then there's the age to come. Well, if we were to put if we were to overlap this, like what does that mean? If we were to overlap this with a Platonic month, what that would mean would be that the present age is the age of Pisces, the age that Christ ushered in and brought this whole new transformation of the world, this saving of people, bringing them to God. And then the age to come would be the next age. That would be the age of Pisces, whatever that's going to be. And by the way, uh, the- Aquarius. Uh, oh, sorry, Aquarius, Aquarius yeah. yeah. Aquarius. Yeah. Yeah. And Aquarius, uh, so it's like, Right now, where we're at, where we are on the great year calendar is essentially December 30th or 31st. And Aquarius, whenever it begins, and nobody really is quite sure, that will be essentially be January 1st of the great year. So it's not like we're in March or June or yeah. you know, September. We're we're literally at the very end of the great year. This whole cycle is about to start over again. So the thought is, what if the a millennium, the thousand years, is actually can be equated with an age and the age to come. If that was the case, then in the way that I look at eschatology, Satan would be bound for the last 2,000 years to not deceive the nations, and then he would be unleashed right at the end of that thousand years, which in this way of looking at it would be basically right about now. Mm, yeah. Is this like the start of the fourth age? 
Well, so yeah, we don't know. Like there's been all kinds of ages. It, you, we, we do know written history essentially goes back to the age of Taurus, the bull. And you have all kinds of bull worship taking place before Abraham. And then Abraham ushers in the age of Aries, the ram, and sacrifice. Sacrifices last for mm. 2,000 years. And then Jesus ushers in the age of Pisces. Well, if, wouldn't this be the fourth? If you're talking about the cube, you got the, those ages, and this would be the fourth? Well, that's what I hadn't thought about that, a four-sided cube, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. The, the tesseract or whatever? The tesseract, right. It's always a cube. What if it's a, in, ru- in what if the, it's a Rubik's cube? Justice though? League, the cube too. <laughs> this is an 80s show. Is this the beginning of the fourth age, the completion of the cube? <laughs> I don't know what it is, man, but it's a really strange thing. And, and there's actually a church father named Origen who spoke about this very thing. He speculated about it and said, I don't know, but I think this makes the most sense of many ages to come and the present age and the age to come. And he had no skin in the game because he lived like 1800 years ago. So it's not like this was going to happen in his lifetime. Mm. Yeah. It's all connected. Yeah, you can, you can connect it. If you think about the, we talked about the alignment that happened at the birth of Jesus, you know, if God has, which he has, he's ordained all things in, in, in his timing, these things could coincide. It's, it's they totally would. And, plausible. and, and, and the thing about it is that this actually fits with the way John's been talking about the constellations throughout his book. Like this isn't, I'm not pulling this out of left field. I mean, he's been doing this all, the whole time. So why would I think that he would stop? Right. That's a good point. I'm not saying that this is going to be the case. I, I, I hate date setting and stuff. I don't know. I think it's interesting and worth thinking about. I wish, I wish there would be some scholarship that would look into it um, a little bit more, but this is now when you announce your book, 22 Reasons Christ is Coming Back in 22 <laughs> by Doug Van Dorn. <laughs> or 23, we already we're missed that. The end. We're getting to the end. You, you'd, launch it, you'd launch it with a, with a month left. You'd be like, well, it's, you got a lot of confidence. <laughs> I think we have lost the ability to see the pattern for sure as a human race. Whatever has happened to us, we've almost gone to sleep and we've lost the ability to see these things mirror and they, they repeat. History repeats. Things come back around. The sun comes up every day. The moon comes out every night. You know, they're the way that God framed things is there's little clues in all of these systems that we're a part of. And I don't, I don't know, human beings just, I think we just get used to the world being so magical because it is magical. I mean, every, all of this is if you stop and you just, you have, you know, you have a moment where you, you're, you have a sober weed moment and you're like, like what we're all a part of for whatever reason, when you smoke weed, that's when you're like with your buddies and you're like, Oh man, this is all crazy. And you have all these high ideas, but high ideas, when as, you, they, as you can call it high ideas. High ideas yeah. <laughs> but that's the moment, you know, when most people just like step back and they just, they realize the story that they're a part of, but I just think we've lost the ability to see. And then when Luke and I go back in this show and we talk about the giants and where they were and what they were building and why they were building it. And there's this whole history that we haven't been taught and there's all these creatures involved in it. It's never random. Things are never random. The idea that God created the skies and the stars to declare his glory and that humankind in astrology has decided that the stars instead will declare ours. And isn't that a picture of, of, of just the deception? I find, I mean, it's been mind blowing in a lot of ways to just to understand the way that the ancients understood and laid things out and the, the non accidental part. And I think, Nate, I'm always blown away when we talk about how so much of this stuff is only visible from above. And yet somehow they were able to do this. And we've had episodes <laughs> in the pyramids, Doug, where we've talked about yep. the preciseness of the alignment and the way they sat and the, and the angles. And it's unbelievable. And you realize that they, we know less now than we did then. And I think that, um, you know, as far as this show is concerned, something to tell people is that the blurry creatures, as fun as they are and interesting to talk about, is that the Bible actually encompasses that whole world. And God has a plan for the blurry creatures, just like he has a plan for us. And um, if they're fallen blurry creatures, then God's going to punish them and and none of them are going to, going to be able to not worship him, you know, whether they worship him against their will or not. If the one third is kind of a picture of how many rebelled, two thirds didn't rebel, and they're still in alignment with him. They're still mm. doing what he uh, wants them to do, both up there and down here, however they interact with us. And so, you know, the Bible is just full of this, of this worldview that we just are, we're not used to seeing. And, 
and uh, there's 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 meaning to the blurry creatureness. <laughs> you know, one episode we did a while ago, this idea that that that, that Jesus is outside of time. And this idea that all the other created blurry creatures are inside this time machine, right? They can manipulate inside. Some of them have a little bit more powers than others. But these constellations going back and forth kind of reminds me of Alpha, Vo- Alpha and Omega, time going forward, time going backwards. They're all subject to it, but Christ isn't. It's interesting the way the, the constellations might mirror time itself. They're also, they're also mirroring the law. So um, we, we talk about the natural laws, right? Gravity is a, a law of nature. Well, so are the motions of the planets. They do exactly what God wants them to do. And it's a, that, that right there is a picture of what he wants us to do in the moral realm. We're supposed to obey him and do what he, he wants us to do. That's what Israel was supposed to be around the tabernacle. And of course, we all blow it, but the Lord didn't blow it. And that's why we're able to mm. have this conversation. That's right. So here's my last my last question, Doug. What's the next big sign in the heavens coming? Well, I mean, uh, there could be little ones. I don't know, but to me, it would be this. It would be this movement from Pisces to Aquarius, and you know, so it takes it takes seventy two years for one degree of that circle to go around. So it's not like you can predict a day. People have tried to do this with like 2012 and stuff. And I think that's actually interesting. Maybe we entered into that age in 2012. I don't know. Like we're in some weird times right now. We all know that. And so maybe maybe a switch has been flipped. I don't know. But just this movement out of one age to the next, to me, that's something to to take pretty seriously. It's certainly a heavenly sign, but it's not something that I'm going to die on a hill for i could be totally wrong about this yeah well i love it because you know we talk a lot about giants on the show building these megalithic like stonehenge to the summer solstice and they they understood these things and they were building these stone circles all over the world for a reason with mathematical precision and we're just the dummies especially modern things have no idea like we don't even know what a star is because we can't even see them because our skies are so bright at night yeah, we got people make we got people making millions doing being, being trails, foot right? models. <laughs> we got people making millions being foot models. Smoggy. We've come we've gone backwards. <laughs> we have gone backwards. I love this episode, Doug. You really kind of bring a lot of things we've heard on the show all together in one episode to understand that the ancients were playing that 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 celestial chess game and they knew where they were putting the pieces and we're just trying to figure it out now, thousands of years later. And maybe, just maybe, we're coming to the end beginning of a new age and some weird blurry stuff's going to start happening and these fallen stars might start walking around yeah i don't know man i i hope it's not the new age i hope that it's the age of of christ coming and doing some really amazing things yeah maybe blurry con will just kick it off nate maybe that'll that'll be the (laughs) that's the date to look for (laughs) (laughs) well doug we're we're grateful as always for your for your for your time and friendship talk to people about what what's coming down the pike yeah where they can you know see see the stuff specifically that these the series of lectures on this and the other things you're doing people can engage in that yeah again um so this this talk with with the slides will be at defenderconference.com and that's coming up i think november the 4th and should be some more information there certainly a whole nother presentation as well that's related to this with serpent mounds i'm working uh hard on trying to get out uh my longer version of my uh um Q and A companion to the unseen realm, which has like forty more questions with it, which actually has deals with some of the eschatology we talked about tonight, and then I have a uh, a commentary, a two volume commentary on that that would explain each of the questions and answers. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting that out. I hope it'll be within the next few months. Well, I don't know awesome. yet. That's awesome. Yeah, mm. and also, that's awesome. I mean, I would point out real quick: we have a lot of listeners yeah. that are reading or have read the unseen realm. Yeah. Absolutely. So this will be a really cool. Did I ever piece tell you guys a story out. of that? No. So I had written hmm. this, what I was calling like a supernatural catechism, just questions and answers. And on a whim, I decided to send it to Heiser, and I didn't know him. I had interacted with him on a message boards hmm. before, but I sent it over to him and seen if anything would happen. He writes me back, like he doesn't write anybody back because even back then he was that busy. 
he writes to me back and goes, I love this song. I want to publish this. And I was all fired up. And then I get an email an hour later and he goes, I don't love it anymore. I don't, there's some stuff in here I don't like. <laughs> so <laughs> I, <laughs> I think it was mostly because it was dealing with the stuff he didn't like was dealing with stuff he wasn't talking about in his book. He was thinking he could use it for his book. And so I just wrote back and I said, hey, man, you can use this mm. any way you want. That's why I send it to you. If you think you can use this for your unseen realm, then do it. And so Lexum ended up publishing that as the question and answer companion to the unseen realm. It even has the very mm. same cover on it. So I'm kind of proud of that. I think it's pretty neat. And we've That's awesome. we ended up striking up a friendship and doing a That's podcast cool. of our own together called Paranormal that you can go and check out and yeah. stuff like that. So kind of a funny, funny thing. Yeah. That's the attitude to have in this space, you know, just trying to help help people and, and people who listen to our show. Go go buy all of Doug's books and get in there because he's been generous with his material on our show and with other people just trying to get the truth out. But everyone's got to sell a few copies to, to keep the lights on. So we appreciate you, Doug. It reminds me of that American <laughs> pop song. You remember this one, Doug? Boy no, Meets no. Girl, Waiting for a Star to Fall. That remember that one? <laughs> no. That was a hit. That was a hit. Come on, nobody? 80s? Whatever. I'll send you the song Never. after this. You'll remember it. Love you, Doug. Thanks so much. I remember when I, our first episode with you, I was calling your, I think I was calling the church phone number, leaving messages. You remember that? I do remember that, yeah. <laughs> and I only really ever answer my home, my uh, cell phone because it's just a spam number these days. Don't yeah. let Nate loose on the on the on the old school phone. He'll, <laughs> he'll light up that landline. We're gonna we were gonna get you on the show one way or the other. <laughs> I'm glad we did. Glad we did. For yeah. sure, it's been great to get it get a good friendship going with you guys. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. you, brother. I'm gonna put that song on the outro here. Don't you worry. Then you'll know. <laughs> we have to do some like uh, audio spots with our guest Luke. Get him to be like, "You're now entering the blurry verse." Do like we're doing like a radio show. Yeah. Like, we're yeah. Like, we need to start Make doing sure that you with- listen to Y105. <laughs> yeah. Now that we got you on your hot mic, be like, <laughs> yeah. I'm Doug Van Dorn, and you're listening to <laughs> Blurry Creatures. <laughs> All right, here we go. This is Doug Van Dorn, and you are listening to Blurry Creatures Podcast. And cut. Let's go. <laughs> this is Doug Van Dorn, and you are now entering the Blurry Verse. Dude, yes. You, you, hey, you got that voice though. You're like, coming, <laughs> coming this summer, the blockbuster <laughs> event of all events. <laughs> <laughs> a movie you, a movie, for, a film for the ages, starring Gary Busey. You're like, this is not a film for the ages. <laughs> <laughs>